Greetings everyone and welcome again to the 55th session of the online Optom learning series OOLS. So let me introduce to you our speaker for today. Uh, today we have uh, Optom Pancham Kulkarni. Uh, Optom Pancham is uh, uh, optometrist definitely and has finished his masters in optometry from UNSW Australia. He has 17 years of experience in optical retail dealing with various types of spectacle frames and lens materials as well. He is also an adjunct associate professor at the Lotus College of Optometry, Mumbai, India. He is also a research guide for undergraduates and postgraduate students. He has a teaching expertise in dispensing optics and contact lenses. And today, sir, is going to talk to us about different spectacle frames and lens selection, which is basically uh, on the visual needs. So when you have a patient or a customer walk into your practice, how would you go about selecting a frame and, uh, you know, selecting the lens based on their visual needs? So uh, welcome, Pancham, sir, on our platform. Uh, thank you very much. And now I will leave the screen time to you. Okay. Thank you, Fakruddin. Uh, nice uh, small intro you gave me. Good one. And good evening, everyone. Uh, hope I'm loud and clear. So, talking yes, for today is uh, uh, like already Fakruddin has mentioned, uh, spectacle frame and lens selection based on visual needs. And I've put up a uh, few photos of my practice over here. The, on the left hand side is my showroom, and the clinic is on the right hand side, just to give you guys an idea where I work. Okay, just a quick disclaimer that this uh, PPT is not sponsored by any company because uh, during the course of the presentation, I'll be like saying this particular brand I found better than the other. So no one has sponsored this presentation. It's purely my thoughts. Like at the second point says that the thoughts and views mentioned are purely based on personal experience and all images and product names are trademark of the respective companies. Okay, so I'm not claiming anything. And this purely on my personal experience. It can uh, differ from person to person and that's acceptable. Okay, so what is the key to a satisfied customer? Okay, so uh, accurate refraction, uh, selection of appropriate lens and frame, measurements and lens fitting. Okay, so if all these three cycles are basically taken care of, you end up having a satisfied customer. But what I've seen generally, especially the optons who are new recruits, uh, they generally only, they only have, want to do a accurate refraction. They don't uh, show some much interest in selecting a lens frame uh, measurements, yes, they do. But again, uh, they are, I think when, when the final specs arrives, I'm not sure if most of them are actually going and, you know, checking if uh, the frame is uh, or the spectacles are made according to the prescribed power. So what I want is to optometrists to come out of this uh, refraction thing. I mean, yes, refraction is their primary job, no doubt. But I want them to take some keen interest in selection of appropriate lens and frame also. Okay. Uh, because their inputs matters a lot. The, uh, the, uh, your patient looks, to, uh, looks up to you like a doctor, your eye doctor, and he wants you to give inputs. And probably by giving the correct inputs, you will help ending up having a satisfied customer. So remember this, uh, this, this chain over here. All this, ch this chain must be fulfilled well for a satisfied customer. Okay. So choosing the best frame material. Now, I'll not go about in detail. I'll just talk about the basic uh, frame materials which we come across in day-to-day -day practice. I mean, I assume you have done this in your Bioptom course, so I'll not go in much detail, just about the regular materials which we encounter in the day-to-day -day practice. So let's start with the plastic frame materials. And one common question you keep, you all must be having in detail is, why are your frames so expensive than online frames? Okay, this is a very common question in the past three, four years, once the online platforms have launched, that this question keeps arising in front of you, okay? So you have like 80% off or 60% off on frames and they end up, uh, you know, around 200 in the online market, while the frames which in the retail store start for around 500 and above. Okay, so instead of having a price war with these online people, I suggest uh, uh, you explain them the materials and why is your spectacle more expensive than what is available online. So these are the most commonly used uh, materials over here. You have uh, plastic molded frames, TR90 frames, Ultem frames, your cellulose acetate frames and your optile frames. Now, what are these frames basically? Just uh, we'll have a quick summary of them. Okay, coming to the basic one, the plastic molded frames is thin and lightweight and available in attractive colors. So that makes it a very high selling point. It's available in attractive colors. But the problems with this type of frame is dirt cheap. It breaks very easily. I mean, if you get knocked off, it is really going to break. Not very uh, recommended for kids. 
uh, it is unable to grip higher x lenses now most of the time uh, i have uh, my clients coming to me getting this uh, plastic molded frame and they expect me to you know a fit a minus 6 dot type of lens in this type of frame the problem with this frame is, is it does not have that power to grip that lens uh, sufficiently so you know in some cases the lens can get dislodged and crack so i usually explain to them the problems with this type of uh, plastic frames uh, again the color also wears off with sweat so it's a allergic reaction can take place and these frames are like really dirt cheap you know if you go to the wholesale market you'll get them for around 50 rupees okay and the online people what are they doing they are, they are quoting a mrp of 1000 80% of 200 there is what they are selling it to you so i mean you pay is what you get so you cannot expect quality in this type of a frame okay but if you are using a spare frame then you can opt for this something for emergency type of thing this is a fairly sufficient decent material you can say you can use it but for the primary frame i strongly recommend not to use this okay coming to the new modern frames uh, modern frame materials the tr90 nylon and ultem frames uh, the tr90 is a swiss made uh, material and the ultem is uh, very similar in property both are plastic de uh, derived only so they are thin lightweight flexible like the photograph shows over here is hypoallergenic so you know it uh, does not react with your skin the only problem with this type of frame is you know you are unable to customize fit according to the patient's face contour so if if you someone comes to you and he selects this frame and he says please tighten to behind my ears or you know it's a bitting a good loose just level it nothing can be done with this type of a frame okay you'll end up burning up this frame if you try to heat it so the positive of this is is thin lightweight cost wise also is pretty much decent around 500 rupees starting 500 rupees can go higher also Uh, hypoallergenic only thing a problem is with the fit you cannot align the fit with this type of a frame okay and if you go online you'll see that these types of frames are available around 700 starting okay so you are pretty much at uh, in level with them okay coming to this miraflex frames uh, this is another uh, very popularly uh, frames you must have seen this types of photos uh, <clears throat> is basically used for your infants and uh, toddlers Uh, new bonds also probably and uh, the company website has not claimed which material they use but most likely it's a tr90 material what they use and uh, what is so great about these frames is it's very lightweight there are no metal parts screws and nose pads so there is a very less la likely chance of a breakage and all that and it's flexible hypoallergenic and uh, only downside i would say is the cost okay 3500 is the cost which is slightly on the higher side okay acetate is my favorite material i mean uh, why i'll tell you about in the slide it's easily adjustable on heating so if anyone wants to align it on the uh, your nose or uh, sorry the nose or the ears it's uh, very easily done and uh, lightweight durable hypoallergenic excellent dye absorption so you have variety of colors and most of these frames come with a spring attachment because they are not flexible like your tr90 frames okay they are not flexible so to add to the flexibility the spring can be easily attached to this type of frame like the spring attachment can be done over here to give it flexibility and uh, to give it strength you have most of these frames come with a steel wire in the temples you can see in this low photograph over here you can see a steel wire over here so that gives strength to the uh, frame uh, you can easily bend the frame over here and, and uh, the life of the frame increases okay cost is 700 starting but your price can go as high as say 10000 also depending on the brand and these italian companies are basically selling handmade uh, acetate as a as a usp to justify their high prices so you the cost of this frame can go from 700 all the way to 10000 even higher depending on the brand what they are using okay coming to more premium material the optile so this optile is a uh, is a patented material of safilo group and safilo group consists of your carrera your mark jacob uh, hugo boss all these companies come under the safilo umbrella so it's a patented material only safilo has a rights to sell this material so if any other person is selling you a optile most likely is not a optile uh, it's a premium material long lasting it's lighter than acetate by 20% not much but it's lighter again is hypoallergenic it's heat resistant okay being heat resistant is again a positive point as well as a negative point positive point means the life of the frame increases drastically it will not brittle with age but a negative point is again the fitting i mean if somebody asks you can you please you know heat it and you know make me fit it over my ear and all then with such frame is going to really be a, going to be a tough job and if you are going to overheat this you are going to end up uh, damaging the frame and already these frames start with like 3000 rupees and upwards can go all the way high as 50000 also so you don't want to you know heat this frame and damage the finishing of this type of frames okay so just a quick uh, 
summary we had uh, most common materials your plastic molded tr90 ultim cellulose acetate and optile i said cellulose acid is the best because like i said fitting is much very very much easier and this is helps a lot in progressive types of when you fit progressive lenses in this type of frame where the fitting is a must for these patients and now you can justify why your frames are expensive than the online frames okay a quick summary of uh, metal frames uh, you have monal metal which is basically an alloy nickel and copper com combination uh, only problem is uh, the advantage is cheap but uh, is allergic and the allergy re reaction can happen due to the nickel because nickel is a very cheap material reacts with the skin cost is also pretty much low you have aluminum again lightweight and inexpensive uh, problem variety of colors available not fa fairly cheap you can say 550 rupees and upwards only problem again difficult to solder stainless steel very premium material you can say cost also not very high 600 rupees only uh, thin sturdy corrosion resistant lustrous hypoallergenic so it got all the properties in it and the most premium material of this is titanium in metal you all must be knowing about it titanium is the lightest material if you combine both plastic materials and uh, metal materials titanium is got to be the lightest of all met uh, materials combined okay so it is thin lightweight flexible strong most you seen in your uh, rimless frames uh, it's hypoallergenic if 100% pure corrosion resistant only problem is available in limited colors and it is difficult to weld this okay so again those uh, uh, fitting uh, issues can happen with this type of a frame it's expensive it starts from 3000 so suppose you have a dealer who tries to sell you for around 50 or something just watch out it cannot be a pure titanium at that price so a good quality titanium generally starts from 3000 rupees and upwards okay now selecting the appropriate lens we have spoken about the frame now comes the lens part and now i feel the optometrist must take charge over here okay like like i already mentioned optometrists are just satisfied doing the refraction but uh, this is also a specialist job okay uh, because everything the lens depends on what is the age of the patient is it a adult or is it a college going kid or a or a, what to say a, a child what is his refractive error is a single vision or a presbyo or what is what is visual needs like is it uh, more of indoor work outdoor work and another thing what i found out is uh, please do not manage the finances of your patients now what i mean by this statement is a lot of us assume that you know this particular frame uh, this lens is going to be expensive so this person cannot afford it okay so don't uh, have that judgment every patient has a right to know the whole variety what is available in his uh, for his category but what i mean by that is this use this company layout chart this is the progressive lens lay layout chart now you have a lens starting from 3500 which can go all the way high to 25000 okay so based on your judgment you can just tell him sir you why don't you take this 7000 rupees lens and you know but he is at the same time is also looking at this other lenses also so even if you don't mention about these lenses he knows oh such a premium product is available in the market and he might ask you out of curiosity sir what about these lenses what are these lenses so then you can take your time you can explain them they have you know lower peripheral uh, astigmatic zones so you have a more wider field of view and more easy to adapt lesser swim effect you know you can explain them but just don't give him a single option so this is the best lens for you i think you should go for this and uh, don't these are more premium lenses it's not for you so don't uh, try to you know manage the finances of your patient now in, uh, in most of the occasions what has happened uh, the government office are very close to my practice okay so you have this uh, uh, modestly dressed employees coming to me and since the government is paying for the spectacles uh, they end up buying a very high end spectacle but if i don't show them this option then they'll never know that such a premium lenses exist so just show them the whole range let them select whatever is best for them so like i said the range goes from 4000 to 25000 rupees okay these are the most commonly dispensed lenses your cr your high index lenses 1.6 67 1.7 uh, you know about all this bi focus progressive anti reflection coat photochromatic now when I, when i get a new recruit salesman or optum whoever it may be they only end up selling up these lenses okay there are tons of uh, newer design and newer material lenses available in the market which we will just discuss now so don't just limit yourself to this okay coming to high index lenses all of you know know what is a high index lens it's a especially for uh, people with a high rx uh, you get a thinner lens over here as you can see in this photograph you get a thinner lens for high rx uh, it's available both in glass and plastic 
the cr the 13 are plastic ones you the highest index available right now is 1.7 and in glass it can go as high as 1.9 okay so if you want uh, thinness is the issue go for the glass only thing is glass is breakage can happen because of the increase in weight only problem with high index lenses is high index reflect 50% more light than conventional cr 39 lenses okay so uh, arc code becomes a must with this type of lenses ARC is strongly recommended to bring down the reflections and cost is like 2000 for a 1.6 index lens and can go as high as 16000 rupees okay now what are the modern uh, tech uh, this is not a modern technology but uh, for some reason i don't know the staff is like hesitant to sell these type of lenses maybe due to the increased cost like these start from around 4600 and uh, this is like 2000 so almost double the price but if you explain it well it's a very good product the aspheric lenses now what are aspheric lenses so ordinary lenses have a spherical front surface. Aspherics don't have a spherical front surface. What they are basically? Aspheric lenses gradually change from the center to the periphery on the front surface. So curvature in minus lens will get steeper towards the periphery and vice versa. Curvature in a uh, concave lens, uh, sorry, convex lens will get flatter towards the periphery. So what, by doing this, what is happening? It is helping in providing good clarity in peripheral uh, periphery and also there is reduction in spatial distortion. Okay, now this is the photograph I was showing you. Now this is a spherical lens over here. You can see the amount of distortion at the periphery. This is the aspheric lens over here. Distortions are fairly reduced. And this is the double aspheric lens. So the front and the back both are basically altering the curvature to giving the minimum spatial distortion possible. Okay, so what you end up having in an aspheric lens is a thin and a flat lens profile. It also reduces the magnification minification. Now, what do I mean by this? Okay, what do you mean by reduction in magnification minification? Now, suppose it's a 10 diopter myo and he is wearing a, a, a high index lens. So, the lens is going to be thin, but, but his eye is going to look small. Okay, so even though the lens is thin, his eye is going to look very minified and that's, you know, going to look really ugly on his face. So you can suggest a aspheric or a double aspheric lens. I'll show you a photograph over here. Yeah, this is one client who had come to me and he's a minus 10 uh, myo. You can see the lenses are thin over here, but look at his eyes looking minified over here. And now I've given him a Nikon double aspheric lens and just look at his eye. I mean, just looking as if he's not wearing a high index lens. Okay, so it's looking so clear no distortions, no that magnification, minification effect is happening over here. So happy customer, you might end up giving me a few, more, a few more referrals also. Only downside I would say is the cost, 9,200 and upwards depending, uh, depending on your refractive error. So what do we have over here? We had 2,000 high index lens, 4,600 doubling, cost has doubled. And 9,200 again the cost has doubled, but I think the price is justified, okay? I had another patient who was supposed to get married and he didn't want to wear contact lenses. And I suggested, strongly suggested this uh, double aspheric lens. I showed him this photograph also and I, he ended up spending because you want, everyone wants to look the best on your marriage day, right? So uh, these are the best options currently available. Okay. okay. Problems with aspheric lenses is flattening the curves increases reflections. Okay. It's not a very uh, uh, breaking problem. You can always have an anti-reflection coat on these lenses and your, your, your reflections are going to reduce further down. Uh, another issue over here is the abbey value is lowered, okay, with increase in index. Now, what is your abbey value? Abbey value is basically your chromatic abrasion. So, lower the abbey value, lesser is going to be the clarity of the lens. So, with aspheric lenses and high index lenses, the abbey value is substantially drops. So, basically, you can add a anti-reflection coat and you can, you can, you know, you can increase the clarity of your lens. So, hope I am unclear what is the difference between high index. It has a spherical front surface, aspheric, aspheric front surface and double aspheric both the front and the back have a aspheric surface okay so minimum distortions see this is just a summary of what i just spoke about uh, if you see uh, this is the glass over here and this is your cr13 and plastic so if you see as the index goes higher the abbey value is coming down significantly like at 1.523 and 1.9 the abbey value is dropping by almost half so again, strongly ARC recommended. Same thing with the CR39. Abbey value is dropping as the index keeps on increasing. So again, it's a must to suggest a ARC code.
Okay, impact resistant lenses. Now, this is another thing which uh, the new recruits uh, or the students who newly join a practice don't recommend. And it's a must you at least make the patients aware of that such a lens is available and not just uh, be satisfied selling uh, your normal CR39 lenses. Now, everyone knows about polycarbonate lenses. I'll just quickly summarize. So, polycarbonate is the first high impact lens which was launched uh, decades ago. It has a fairly high uh, refractive index 1.59. Only problem with uh, polycarbonate is a poor Abbe value of 30, okay? So your CR39 has a 59 and this has a 30, which is like half of your CR39. It is also scratched easily, it's difficult to tint an edge. It's not very chemical resistant. So if you're going to use your acetone, just be, I mean, don't use it like too frequently on this lens. It, you, you might damage the optics of this lens. And there's also a law in USA and your, in most of the European countries that if you're dispensing a spectacle lens uh, to, a, to a child, you must prescribe a polycarbonate lens. Now, this rule is followed very strictly in the foreign countries. So, if you have a, in a, a patient, NRI patient coming to you, may just make them aware of this law. Uh, in fact, if you are having a practice in US and you end up selling a CR39 lens to a kid, your license can also get revoked in some extreme cases. So, this is a must in uh, your foreign countries. Uh, price is slightly higher than your CR39, is 3870. So, is this the best material, impact resistant material? No, there's something better than this also. You have a Trivex or Trivex. Uh, many companies have, uh, call, give, have given their own names. Uh, the Hoya calls it the Phoenix or PNX material. And there's another company which calls the same material Trilogy. Both are nothing but the Trivex material only. It's a ureth urethane based ma ma monomer material. It's lighter than polycarbonate also. And what big advantage you have over here is higher a bay value of 45 okay your polycarbonate had 30 this is 45 so optically is much superior to your polycarbonate uh, it is not suitable for high prescriptions not that you cannot make high prescriptions but because of the lower refractive index the lenses are going to look a bit thick so won't i won't recommend this for uh, powers more than minus 5 diopters uh, it is recommended for children and rimless frames you can easily drill holes in them and it's very uh, chemical resistant also and excellent for tinting and coating okay so polycarbonate just gave you an advantage of refractive index and impact resistance but apart from that there's a lot of advantages your trivex material giving you cost is also not very high 4200 versus a 3870 of a polycarbonate so just for that 300 extra rupees you're getting very optically superior lens Okay, so if you summarize, summarize the differences, uh, 1.5 and 1.53, so definitely polycarbonate wins over here. It has a superior refractive index. Abbe value, Trivex wins. Specific gravity also Trivex means the lens is lighter than your polycarbonate. Uh, sorry. Uh, impact resistant properties are very similar. Trivex is slightly more expensive and both provide 100% UV protection. Okay, if you see this photograph over here, it will show you how superior the, not how, I mean substantially superior, but it is a bit superior than uh, polycarbonate. Now, if you concentrate on this E over here, if you see this E over here is much clearer in Trivex lens. And if you look at the polycarbonate lens, you can see the, a lot of distortion is coming at the E. Okay, so this suggests that uh, even on paper, it, we know that it's 45 versus 30. So this is an example of that. Okay, so just don't stick to your polycarbonate. Always, I all I generally recommend Trivex because I like Trivex. It's optically superior lens, so go for a Trivex. I, su I suggest. Okay, in even in anti-reflection coatings, I have seen mostly people only uh, you know prescribe your standard ARC coating only. But there's something called a multi-layer ARC coating also available. Okay, and companies have given them different names like SLR calls it uh, Sapphire 360 or your Crizal UV, your Hoya calls it HVLL. Your Nikon calls this C code. So everyone is having their own name, brand names. They are nothing but multi-layer ARC coatings. Apart from your ARC advantage, they are also giving you advantage of being smudge free, dust repellent, water repellent. They have increased scratch protection compared to your standard ARC lenses. Easy to clean also. So if you are giving it to a child or a sportsman who generally, you know, he scratches the lenses very often, then this is a, a superior quality coating even in high end high refractive errors where the you know, the abbey value is going to drop you can always suggest a multi layer arc coat okay now coming to this hot topic uh, blue filter and blue cut lenses okay now 
for the past four months i think this inquiries of these lenses have uh, rocketed up you know all you all know the other reasons for the same and both are not same okay the blue filter and blue cut lens are not the same i'll just talk about it let's talk about what is the significance of blue light blue light inhibits production of the hormone melatonin which is needed for good sleep and it stimulates the production of cortisol which is a stress alerting hormone and it interferes with your sleep okay prolonged blue light exposure leads to damages your retinal cells raising the risk for eye diseases including cataracts and armt and studies have also demonstrated a developing connection between blue light exposure and obesity as well as diabetes okay but let me make a point clear over here blue light does not just come out from your gadgets okay it is also is present in the uv light so even if you are roaming around outdoors your uv light has blue light and it, that blue light can still damage your retinal cells so that's just a clarification that gadgets is not the only source of blue light okay now coming to this uh, topic the blue filter versus blue cut we'll talk about the blue filter the blue filter example of that lens the crisal preventia by essilor and what is this blue filter is it is specific specifically it blocks only 415 to 455 nanometer of the retinal damaging light okay so it does not cut off the entire blue light spectrum it is only cutting the 415 to 455 nanometer uh spectrum of the blue light and why the crisal preventia works that way is because the 480 nanometer spectrum will not sorry the crisal preventia does not block the 480 nanometer spectrum and therefore will not affect separation of melatonin so you don't want the entire blue light to go away because we want some production of melatonin to happen for a, for a good sleep so you don't want the entire blue light to be uh, cut off permanently so that is why this blue filter lenses are more superior than the blue cut lenses because blue cut lenses block all the blue light okay whatever the good bad everything gets blocked and that is bad for your eyes because i read a study recently which says that blue light is essential for the uh, because if you cut off the whole blue light there is a going to be progression in, of myopia also i read a study uh, recently about that that if your some blue light is essential for the child so and if you are going to deprive the child of the of the blue light then his myopia can progress the paper said that so uh that is a thing and this is the common experiment you you know your sales staff or your the marketing staff comes to you and says sir our lens is so superior they'll shine a torch on your lens and the whole blue light gets cut off and you say oh wow this lens works great but actually this lens is a very bad for the eyes always offer a blue filter these blue cut lenses come also very cheap they like around 500 rupees to 1000 and so you feel a oh, why spend for a blue filter lens which is like you know almost four times the cost of a blue cut lens but this blue cut lens is nothing but a marketing gimmick and you want some light to pass through it okay one important point i just remembered from a uh, blue filter is that white surface is appear yellowish with blue filter with a blue filter lens okay so if you hold the lens against a white background the white background is going to look a bit yellowish now this is not a very deal breaker but uh, my practice is is close to a diamond hub okay so i have lot of this diamond assorters who come to me for spectacles and when this lens was newly launched I remember giving this lens to one of the diamond assorters, and he came back and told me, "Sir, my diamonds are looking of inferior quality because instead of looking white, they were looking yellowish." So he said, "Sir, I rejected so many diamonds today, but then later on, I found out that the, there's something wrong with this lens." So I had to, I spent time some explaining him that that is because of the blue filtering effect. Your diamonds are looking uh, yellow in color. Actually, they are white, but because of the filtering effect, uh, it is called yellow. So somehow he was not so satisfied. Uh, with this lens, and uh, so always make a point. You just uh, you know mention uh, whoever may be that about the this yellowish effect of a blue filter lens. Okay, another common question. Sorry, just one minute. Another common question: What you get on your counter is, can I turn my phone setting to blue block instead of buying spectacles? Okay. now all the android phones and your apple phones have this setting you can just go and press and say blue block filter but what studies have found is that light blocking apps don't work okay so you know many a times you suggest a blue filter and that that fellow will turn and tell you sir my phone has this setting why do i need to buy this so you can uh, share this study with him a 2018 study found that apple's night shift app found on its ios devices did not reverse the melatonin separation that arises from my evening exposure to this devices 
so clearly this this act is only good for reducing the glare okay you can reduce the glare and the eyes will feel comfortable but when it comes to blue blocking this app doesn't or any app doesn't work basically okay now coming to our first poll do you think a blue filter lens is necessary for video users just please share your answers yes so about 76% of them think yes a blue filter lens is necessary and uh, about 11% are unsure the rest 14% says no that's that's the view of our audience today okay so expected answer i had but uh, generally what when people ask me sir should i include a blue filter lens i generally my rule is like if you have usage of more than 1 hour on a gadget 1 to 2 hours on a gadget then yes it's recommended uh, generally all of us have more than 2 hours and in this lockdown the the usage has increased further so give a blue filter and not a blue block but everything is not rosy over here there is there was a study done by the american academy of optometry the reference is put up scientific evidence about blue light and what they found was that there is no scientific basis for claims that blue light from digital devices is harmful for people's eyes blue light from computers will not lead to eye disease as its quantity is very small as compared to sunlight like i already mentioned that even the uv light has some amount of blue light so your gadgets are not you are responsible for the whole uh, trouble uh digital eye strain is not caused by blue light okay so digital eye strain if your eyes are feeling tired does not mean the blue light is causing it can be due to you know your less amount of blinking or uh, your accommodation getting tired uh that can be also the cause of digital strain yes your blue light can be one of the contributing factors uh instead they have recommend to take frequent breaks with adequate blinking that will help reduce the strain and they also recommended to reduce glare and brightness of the screen which will help reduce your eye strain further okay so don't don't uh, i mean uh, don't just say yes take a blue filter and you are good to go i mean as a sale point of view yes it is a great uh, profit generating lens but uh, i mean this is the you have contradictory facts about uh, the lens available in research so just take it with a pinch of salt i'll say okay another thing which has come up in your uh, your lockdown is your anti anti fogging lenses and that's the reason i have switched over to contact lenses and not wearing glasses nowadays uh, many of you have must be encountering encountering this problem and there are a lot of uh, products available in the market like you have your liquids your sprays your tissues your gels i have used most of them and all are rubbish basically okay sprays tissues gels what i found was the best among the lot was the optifog coating by slr okay i think that was the best of the lot uh, it's around 1000 rupees more expensive than your normal crystal lens and uh, uh, along with the coating you get a fiber microfiber cloth okay so every day in the morning if you just rub the cloth against the lens and that optifog coating gets activated uh, so i did a did a small experiment over here uh, this is your I, over the coffee mug i kept the lens and if you see over here this uh, lens is completely fogged this is your normal lens arc coated lens and if you see the optifog coated lens only the inferior portion is slightly getting fog it's not like it's 100% fog free your slight inferior portion is still fogging over here this is immediately after i applied the cloth i did this and so you cannot say uh, people who have very high hopes of this uh, coating you cannot say ki, you know this is like 100% totally anti fog uh, just tell them that Uh, compared to normal lens the fogging is going to reduce substantially okay it turns the lens surface to hydrophilic causing even distribution of water droplets okay and rest as the sprays tissue gels i have used all of them of various companies even the nikon ones they are not up to the mark and that's why i don't recommend anyone selling them okay coming to photochromatic lenses transitions now this is a this is a area which not many uh, the sales staff of the optum stock know about there are many available the types of transitions available we'll quickly go through them and uh, the you have your generic photochromatic lenses also and most of the time you know the classic is like twice as expensive as your generic so most of the time these sales staff and all just they end up selling a generic photochromatic lens without telling them the differences between a transition and a generic lens now generic lens is basically it requires a direct exposure to uv light so you have to keep it under uv light and then only it is going to get darkened okay but in your transition classic it can also get activated with indirect light we we'll just talk about this 
So transition classic is not it's okay entry level lens uh, very similar to your uh, generic lenses. Only thing is the darkening fading cycle is very quick you can say with the transition classic. Uh, even this needs a direct UV light for activation. It will it will darken to around uh, uh, 30% if there is no direct UV light not beyond that. It has comparatively slower dark fade cycle if you compare it with your other premium transition lenses. And cost is like 6200. Available only two shades, the grey and the brown. Okay, coming to your transition signature 7. Signature 8, 8 has also launched but it's not yet available in India. So I'll talk about signature 7. Now this is a, it's a very rapid, okay. The darkening fading cycle is like very rapid. Uh, under a minute you will have the lens darkening and also fading. It is 50 to 70 percent darkening even without direct UV light. So if you're wearing your glasses and you're driving and there's no direct sunlight on your face, even these lenses will darken down 50 to 70 percent uh, even under direct UV light. And that's a very useful feature. Okay. Now, most of the times we, we generally we are not standing directly under the sun. So if you, you sell a generic uh, photochromatic lens, the, the customer is going to be uh, dissatisfied. And he's going to say why oh, why these lenses are not turning dark as you had promised. Okay, so the reason is you need a transition signature lens because most of the times we are driving inside a vehicle and uh, we need that darkening effect to happen and that will only happen with your signature series. Now the big benefit of this lens is completely clear in indoor conditions. Okay, so if you're sitting inside uh, in an office, these lenses are completely clear. No one will know that it's a transition lens. Another added feature of this, it filters out 20% of blue light which is arising from a gadget. So that's another cool feature of transition signature series. And if you can add a, a prevention coating on top of that, then you're going to get almost uh, double the amount of blue light protection. Only thing expensive, 10,200, three colors available. And now you have the option of these lovely shades also, your sapphire, amethyst, amber, <coughs> emerald. They look really cool. Once you're in the sun, they turn into this shade. And once you're indoors, they again clear out. So very uh, the style quotient goal, uh, goes, quotient goes up very high when you wear these lenses. If you wear them, you're definitely your friends are going to ask you what is this new type of lens you're wearing. Cost is also getting bumped up though, 13,200. Okay, extra active is the next lens. Like the name suggests, extra active means it darkens more in your signature series. Now, some of the uh, uh, patients complain uh, that, you know, these transition lenses are good, but, you know, they're not getting as dark as your sunglasses. So, then comes your extra active lens into play. It gets activated without direct UV light also. Again, it filters out 30% blue light. Your signature was filtering out 20%. This filters out 30%. Again, you put a pre prevention and that figure goes much higher. It is more darker shade as compared to your signature series on UV exposure. So it becomes more dark, like the name suggests, extra active. And you have a light tint seen indoor also. So unlike your signature, which is completely clear when you're indoors, this has a slight amount of tint to it when you're sitting indoors. And it is darkest in hot climates also. Okay, what I mean by this point, okay, let me explain this point in the next slide. We'll talk about this point in the next slide. Okay, again, it's available in this fancy mirror colors also. This was launched a year back. If you see, uh, once activated, it looks like a mirror over here. And once you come indoors, it looks completely clear. So again, I mean, if you want those fancy mirror colors, like your green, blue, copper, silver, gold, you can opt for this. Remember, cost is again bumping up over here, 14200. But again, if you want to make a statement of people who have a refraction, a uh, high refractive error, don't want to keep a separate set of sunglasses and uh, uh, what is a spectacles, they can always offer a transition. So just to summarize all these three, you have a classic which does not get activated under direct, uh, uh, gets activated only under direct UV light. You have a signature which you can, you know, gets activated even while you're driving. Extra active darkens more than a signature. So these are the differences of all these three lenses. So explain the differences. Let your client select what is best for him. Okay, I forgot the one more lens, which was the transition drive over here. This is not yet launched in India yet, but uh, the company people said yes, it's going to launch, uh, getting launched this year. So basically, it's a polarizing lens. Okay. So what's what's a polarizing lens is going to cut off all your glare, which comes off from your you know while driving and the road reflections which is coming out of the road or you know or if you are at the sea and the reflections coming from the sea or a snowy region. So it's best it's going to cut off your polarized light. 
uh, it is only recommended it's not recommended for indoor use only recommended for outdoor use uh, the reason being is that polarized lens is not so good to, for viewing gadgets okay because the contrast uh, significantly drops while using uh, while looking at the gadgets so it's only a outdoor uh, recommended lens i don't know the pricing because not yet launched yet okay few points to remember uh transitions it works better in cold weather than warm weather okay now this point is very important i mean just mention it to your patients because i had a patient who came from an nri patient who came from uh, uk he used to wear a transition in uk and he bought transition signature from me in india and he said my transitions the the ones which i bought in uk work much better than what are working in india okay the reason for that is transition the molecules of transition which is our oxy uh, oxyzine i think is the material uh, that works gets activated more in cold weather than warm weather now indian climate is warm right and uk is is a quite uh, cold uh, temperatures you have in uk so he said the lenses work much better in uk and the, what you have sold me in india is some cheap brand you have sold me and why are they not working as well as the ones which i have got in uh, in uh, uk so you know i had to you know calm him down i just shared uh, he thought I, i sold him a generic lens under name of transition i shared few internet articles with him and finally i managed to convince him that yes uh, this is the reason for that and uh, so it, uh, so if if you get a nri patient just clarify this point that transitions work better in cold weather than warm weather okay another point to clarify uv protection coated carving shields can interfere with the activation process okay so a lot of these high end cars your you know your german cars and all have this uv protection on their carbon shields and that can interfere with your uh, fading darkening activation process more the uv light exposure so faster the darkening you all know about this okay another deal breaking point over here suppose you have a patient who breaks one transition lens or suppose his one eye prescription changes other eye is the same uh, ideally it is preferred to replace both lenses why i am saying this this problem is more evident in your generic lenses and your transition classic not so high in uh, signature series the reason for that is as the lens becomes older and and the more the uv exposure it gets uh the fading and the lighting uh, light uh, i mean light and the fading cycle lighting and the uh, sorry darkening cycle uh, gets speeded up okay so if it's a 6 month old lens the the rate at which it darkens or lightens is going to be much faster than a new lens so if you are going to only replace one side of the lens and the other eye is going to be like you know the old lens then when it goes in the uv light one side is going to darken very fast and the other side is not going to darken so cosmetically is not going to look so appealing to to the uh, to the viewer is going to view the your patient so just make sure of you clarify this point to them sir i strongly recommend you change both the lenses otherwise you are going to end up with different tints on now if you are going to wear a mirror coat like your extra active is really going to look funny one side is going to be like mirror like and the other is going to be less mirror like so that's a downside of a transition lens you can say that brings us to our second poll would you prefer a transition lens or a sunglasses for a style statement now keep in mind your fancy mirror lenses and your uh, those amber and all those colors which i discussed uh, about and just uh, i mean go about giving your poll okay so i think we have about 80% of uh, the polls here okay, it's kind of 50 50 uh, yeah it's almost 50 50 yep okay so uh, honestly if i walk in I mean, if I have to buy glasses for myself, I'll opt for the transition signature because I have a refractive error. So you know, I don't want to keep two two uh, two two uh, spectacles, uh, you know, and just uh, switch between them. And again, transition offers a very superior quality optical quality of the lens. And if you people or any people who are tight on a the budget, then yes, I think the sunglasses makes more sense because sunglasses start from thousand, and you know, the Polaroid ones go up to like two thousand, and you have good UV protection in a three thousand rupees lens. so cost is a major deal breaker uh, with a transition lens compared to your sunglasses so it's per a personal preference that's why i think the poll also came 50 50 uh, you can always offer a good quality sunglasses they'll also get the job done 
Okay, now this is uh, another, uh, I'll just quickly summarize. Uh, we have a low line bifocal also. Now, most of you know what is a crypto bifocal, what's the executive bifocal. This is a, a few companies have launched a no line bifocal. Now, what's a no line bifocal? It's basically it's a progressive lens without an intermediate zone. Okay, so it only has a distance portion and reading portion. There's no intermediate zone in this type of a lens. So, what advantages you have? Cosmetically, yes, it looks good. It eliminates the visible dividing line, so no image jump. It's a blended freeform backsided bifocal. Uh, periphery distortions are less, but they're not zero, I would say. Uh, like I already mentioned, no intermediate power. Available in wide variety of materials and coatings. Okay, Currently, to my knowledge, only two companies are making it. One is the Shamir, Israel company. Shamir Duo is what they call it. And another company is Xylus. It's a Singapore-based company. And they call their product as Xylus No Line Bifocal. Now, I'll show you a picture of that. Okay. Now, this is your standard bifocal. Observe the image jump happening over here. You can look at this blue line also. It's looking a bit distorted over here because of the image jump. And this is a no line bif bifocal of Shamir. You can see over here the line is fairly straight. There's not much of an image jump. Only thing you can see a slight peripheral distortions happening over here. Okay. So, I mean, I don't dispense this lens much, but since the topic of the day says the latest technologies, I have included this in today's presentation. I generally uh, suggest my uh, patients to buy a progressive lens. Uh, now, I won't go in much detail about the fitting, how to take IPDs and all that, because you people, I think 50% are practitioners and the others are students who already know in their B optum lectures how to go about doing it. Just give you some tips. Uh, this is another common question, sir, which is the best progressive lens I should buy? Okay. So there is a, there's no straightforward answer to this. You, because every progressive design is patient needs specific. Okay. You should patiently take history of them. See what type of work they're doing. Is it outdoor, indoor, or is it a mixture of both? Because there's few progressive lenses, which have a wider distance portion. There are few, which have a wider intermediate and a near portion. So according to his needs, you have to select the appropriate lens for him. And that is why I say the optometrist must come and play a role in this and not just leave it to the sales staff. Okay, what is laptop distance? What is desktop distance? What is reading distance? Now it is a new thing. What is mobile distance also? Okay, what is the frame shape? Uh, is it too narrow or what is it like? What is the refractive error? Okay, all the selection is based based on all these answers is the selection of your progressive lens. Okay, few tips I'll give you, uh, which I think you should, you all should follow for satisfied uh, patients. Patiently understand the client's needs, which I already mentioned. Look, just ask them what is their regular distances and all. Or is it indoor work, outdoor work? Is it architect or whatever he is? A lot of computer work, what he does. Uh, another tip is look for the previous progressive design patient is wearing. Now, ideally, don't, if the patient is happy with the SLR lens, don't necessarily make him jump to a Nikon lens. Okay, If he's happy, say, with the SLR Liberty, you can upgrade that Liberty into a comfort series. But don't try unnecessarily try to shift him from a SLR to a Nikon because you know every company has their own segment inset. So you don't want unnecessary a happy customer to try a different brand and you know end up saying you oh, know sir my SLR lenses are much better. So you can upgrade in that similar brand. Avoid jumping to another brand. Okay, you can easily make out from the logos on the lenses which particular brand is lenses. Another point to remember: higher the add, higher the peripheral distortion. Okay. So plus one diopter addition will have a very less distortion compared to a plus three diopters. Higher the astigmatism, higher the peripheral distortion. So in such cases, always recommend your the premium progressive lenses because you know they are going to be have a wide distance intermediate portion and a reading portion, and the peripheral distortions are going to be minimum. So if you have Say a uh, uh, minus five with a three cylinder and an addition of plus 2.5. You strongly recommend that patient, you know, to opt for a premium design lens and not a entry level, entry level progressive lens. Okay. Now, another thing is make use of the progressive company layout card like this, what I've shown over here. So that ensures that all reading, the distance portion is sufficiently covered in the frame. Uh, respect the minimum fitting height advised by the manufacturer. So if the manufacturer says, if the man manufacturer says that the fitting height needs to be 18, so respect that, choose the 18 millimeters sufficient uh, the fitting height. Ideally, choose frame with some pantoscopic tilt. Okay, so choose some frame with some pantoscopic tilt. 
okay that works very well with the progressive lenses now you people must be thinking oh why not select any frame and then give a pantoscopic tilt but no it is not possible with your tr90 or optile material sometimes it becomes difficult to give a pantoscopic tilt so always look for if that uh, pantoscopic tilt is there or not on your frame before you sell that frame to your patient and another thing what of so every lens has an option of a shorter corridor or longer corridor okay so if you see any varilux lens or any nikon lens the company gives you two options short corridor long a uh, longer corridor so always irrespective of the frame size i select a shorter corridor because somehow i feel that works the best and uh, i have also confirmed this with the companies i asked them how many percent of people order a short corridor and how many percent of people order a long corridor and surprisingly 80 to 85 percent people always order opticians order for a shorter corridor lens so that shows that shorter corridor lenses are much easier to adapt compared to a, a long corridor lens okay these are the frame shapes to avoid for a progressive lens because this is a the height is pretty small so you know the, the fitting uh, the, the reading area can go go out you don't want a dinner plate type frame because you know a lot of distortions are going to happen in this type of a frame you don't want a tight eye frame because you know the again the peripheral distortions are going to come in and you don't want a aviator frame because that uh, your bleeding portion can get cut off in some designs so why these frame shapes okay there are some instruments known as a used to for a customized progressive lens and what i mean by customized progressive lens um, all companies have a customized progressive lens you have uh, you need special instruments to measure all these uh, parameters like the zeiss has is the vizio fit instrument and the slr has the eye partner which is there in my practice so the the instrument basically measures your refractive error so not the refractive error takes into account the refractive error reading distance laptop distance segment inset frame shape panto wrap angle head posture dominant eye so all these parameters are basically incorporated into the lens during manufacturing process so if some some people have a habit of holding a mobile mobile close and some people have a habit of putting laptop like very far from them so the software takes into account all this so if you have a patient who is not so comfortable with the a standard progressive lens always opt for a customized progressive lens only downside is the cost i mean they cost like around 30000 a pair and if you add your fancy coatings and all that the cost uh, the cost can increase further up so but this is a, a, a there as an option now coming to the last section of the presentation uh, myopia control lenses now slr was supposed to launch their myopia control lens in the second quarter now because of the corona pandemic i think it's been uh, delayed again and uh, in the past also you have seen your ophthalmologist uh, prescribe conventional progressive lenses and bifocal lenses but uh, what studies have shown that they have very limited efficacy in controlling myopia i have put up the references and they only work best with children having some binocular vision anomalies okay like uh, people with esotropy and all that uh, they work best in these type of patients and not for regular children with myopia so they are not so effective and that's why these companies have launched few myopia control lenses which are commercially commercially available as of now in india none is available slr was supposed to launch but in the foreign markets yes these are available like you have myopi lux by slr myo vision by zeiss myo smart by hoya and companies are claiming that they slow down the myopia by around 50 to 62% now again this is a company claim so need not be the actual result uh what studies have found let's talk about slr myopi lux and cheng had done a study on this particular lens myopi lux is nothing but a executive bifocal lens with a basin prism in each eye okay that is your slr myopi lux so the cheng uh, enrolled 150 children uh age 8 to 13 years and he divided them into three groups okay so one group was wearing single vision lenses one was wearing standard bifocal lenses executive and one was wearing your myopi lux slr lenses he he did a study and he compared all the three groups what he found was that the efficacy of a standard bifocal was not so different than a myopi lux now myopi lux lenses cost around 20000 a pair okay and your standard executive bifocals are like really dirt cheap like 2000 a pair or even lesser than that so the high cost of myopi lux myopi lux lens not justified uh, that's what the study says further what he found results was that on an average around one diopter 
or less myopia or point millimeter less axial elongation happens over three years. Okay, so that is not much you can say. Uh, we just one day after less myopia is happening over a period of three years, and only drawback of this study was again that the Cheng and his colleagues, one fifty uh, children, they only enrolled progressive myopic children. Okay, so they didn't in, they didn't enroll your normal. Uh, children with uh, normal myopia, they are only enrolled in progressive myopia, and that's why these values can be, uh, you know, a bit uh, uh, bumped up. You can say, I mean, the overestimation of values you can see over here. So fairly good, I can say, uh, not the best. Okay, then come your lenses by Zeiss and Hoya. Okay, and before I jump to these lenses, there's something known as the peripheral refraction concept, which you must understand, because both these lenses are based on this peripheral refraction concept. Now, what is a peripheral refraction? What do you mean by peripheral refraction? Is generally, if it's a myope, you know that the image is formed in front of the retina. So you wear a concave lens to correct that. Now, once you wear a concave lens, you're pushing the image onto the retina, central image, and that's why you're able to see clearly, right? Okay. But in that process, what is happening? The central as well as the peripheral image is formed behind the retina. Okay. So centrally, your the image is yes formed on the retina, so you are able to see it clearly. But peripherally. This image instead of forming on the retina is formed behind the retina, and that is known as your hyperopic defocus. Now, what happens in a hyperopic defocus is that there is a constant stimulation for the eyeball, you know, to try and accommodate this image onto the retina, and in doing so, the myopia is increasing. Okay, so researchers, what they are uh, they are trying newer and newer techniques to try and push this image hyperopic defocus into a myopic defocus, because if you achieve a myopic defocus at periphery. The stimulation of eyeball elongation is going to reduce, and your myopia progression is going to reduce. Okay, so there are various techniques like you have your orthokeratology lens, you have a center distance multifocal soft lenses. Orthokeratology lenses have already proven to you know be successful in doing this, but they again they are expensive and requires expertise in dispensing. So both these lenses by Zeiss and Hoya wanted to shift this image into a myopic defocus. Were they successful? We'll just talk about it. Let's talk talk about the Zeiss uh, MyoVision lens, and again the company made tall claims like 60% myopia control and all that. But a study was done, independent study was done by Sankari Dur, and uh, what she did was she made four groups. First group control, we were only with the single vision lenses. Second group, they had a sense. So 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 the uh, MyoVision was designed that the central aperture is clear. Central aperture used to have your distance prescription, and was surrounded by an addition power. Okay, like a plus one or plus two or, or or the third case also plus two. Okay, so central clear vision and the addition at the periphery. And what the guys researchers found was that by doing this, they are they inducing that myopic defocus on at the periphery of the retina. So they made tall claims, like I said, but the study was done by Sankari Dur. Uh, so she took first group as a control lens group. Second was having a distance aperture of twenty millimeters. So this was twenty millimeters surrounded by. Addition of one diopters. Second group was 14 millimeters distance aperture, surrounded by plus two diopter. Third group was 10 millimeter distance aperture, surrounded by a plus two diopter. So you have 20 millimeter, 14 millimeter, and a 10 millimeter. So with various aperture sizes, she compared with the control group. Was she successful? What her results showed that only the type three lens worked with an efficacy of around 20 percent. In Chinese children aged six to twelve, with a family only with a family history of myopia. So in the normal children, they didn't work. Only with children with a family history of myopia, they work, and that also twenty percent. And point two five lower refraction or point zero nine reduced axial elongation over twelve months. So this is still fairly good. And if you have a progressive myopia, you know his error keeps on jumping every six months. And what these lenses have shown that at least there's no jump in. Uh, Refractive error happening over a one hour, uh, one year study period. Okay, so fairly, I would say these lenses work. Uh, efficacy only being twenty percent. So this type three lens work basically is what Sankari Dutt has claimed. Coming to our last lens, the MyoSmart by Hoya, uh, and Myo Hoya calls this lens as a defocus incorporated multiple segment lens. Okay. Again, the company made claims. They are verified by researcher known as uh, Lam and his colleagues among uh, 183 Chinese children aged 8 to 13 with a myopia between one and five diopters. Okay, so what is this lens basically? So this lens has a central nine uh, millimeters distance portion over here, 
of 9 mm diameter and it is surrounded by 3.5 diameters multiple segments okay in in your size what we had we had just one addition power at the periphery over here right in your oya you had multiple 1 mm diameter small 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 spherical three diameter surfaces at the peri uh, surrounding the distance portion now what the hoya researchers found was that this is the best design to create a myopic defocus okay so what what were the results sorry what was the study first so they kept two groups only one was the control group who wore normal spectacle lenses and one was group who wore the dims lens or the defocus incorporated multiple segments and they followed up these children over a period of 2 years now what did they find over here okay children in the dims group had less axial elongation by 62% that is fantastic figure i would say 21.5% children who wore dims lens had no myopia progression over 2 years period and uh, compared to 7.4% who wore seven single vision lenses so 21.5 is like pretty acceptable i would say and efficacy was around 50 to 50 to 60% in hong kong chinese children and 0.444 diopter lower refraction was seen over two year period so that's really great you know you know because in the asian children you have seen the refractive error jumping very very quickly and in fact in wearing this lens your refraction was like 0.44 diopter lesser than your single vision group so fairly good lens not yet launched in india though so if you have to compare all these lenses uh these are the lenses i just spoke about your zeiss myo vision your myo pilux and your hoya and lower these graphs the better basically because this is showing your axial length elongation so lower shorter the graph the better is the lens so if you see over here the slr did not fare as well as the myo vision and the hoya lens because the slr works on a different principle right it it works on your accommodation principle while these lenses work on your myopic defocus principle okay so if you compare all the groups i think the dims lens by hoya worked the best and again it was confirmed by lam that it works fairly good compared to your other brand of lenses that brings us to a third poll what do you think is more convenient to prescribe for sorry what is the question hold on for myopia control in children okay so you have a uh, uh, myopia control spectacles you have low dose atropine you have orthokeratology and you have you have a center distance softness multiple i am asking what is more convenient as a optometrist for you to prescribe based on availability and skills what is more convenient is my question yeah, okay so, so i think a uh, pretty much expected answer see low dose atropine is going to be very convenient i mean it's very cheap also it's like the uh, atropine drops come around like 100 150 but you as an optometrist cannot prescribe that at least in india legally you cannot prescribe that so what as a optometrist point of view i think most convenient will be your myopia control specs because you just you know you don't need any special specialized fitting skills you just uh, sell it over the counter uh, ortho care requires some uh, special skills and your center distance uh, multifocals uh, fairly good you can say uh, but again they are on the expensive side so yes i think i go with the poll over here that the myopia control specs will make more sense okay now coming to a last poll one more poll is there which treatment according to you is most effective in myopia control so first question was how convenient it was this is which is most effective irrespective of the cost yeah, okay so, so this yeah so ortho k is the right answer that what research says ortho k is the best in inducing your myopic defocus uh after that i would say the low dose atropine and the center distance uh, multifocals they're fairly close to each other but i'll opt for a center distance multifocal because of the lesser side effects and you don't want any invasive technique like atropine to be you know injected in the eye time and again uh, and last would be the myopia control specs i know they're very convenient to dispense but if you're looking for a excellent myopia control then yes ortho k is the answer to this okay these are my references and uh, i like to thank the opto online optom learning series team for giving me an opportunity to speak to the practitioners and the students and also thank uh, mr fakrudin for uh, presenting me this opportunity okay thank you everyone
okay thank you so much sir i think uh, it was a very uh, comprehensive uh, session so the first question is uh, the, about the thermal bleaching if you have any idea like in theory we read that uh, you know thermal bleaching is something which is uh, does it work with transitions as well thermal bleaching <laughs> works uh, thermal bleaching is more evident in uh, your your what to say uh, your generic lenses and your classic lenses because classic transition classic is a very age old technology it's like almost 15 20 years old technology but with the signature series company claims there is none but based on a personal experience yes there is a bit amount of still there and you still need to make a patient aware that there sir if he is very a picky person you have to make him aware that yes if, if you are going to replace one lens you know that uh, difference in color can happen so don't go by company claims uh, based on my experience no i'll say no okay okay the next question is about uh, about what would you suggest uh, to a patient if she is already a blue cut lens wearer and they want to switch to a blue filter lens is it recommended or do you, would you keep some key points in mind while doing that i would i would strongly not recommend a blue cut lens only because that only the disadvantages of a blue lens blue cut lens it is even blocking the essential light also okay yeah. so if you want to uh, recommend a blue filter because blue filter is not suppressing melatonin which is with the essential light and like i said i already have read a study you can google it up also that if you give blue cut lenses in children it is going to bump up your their refractive errors so provide them with a blue filter or just give them an arc but don't give them a blue cut lens i would say that okay but if they are already wearing a blue from before would you switch them to, to a blue filter yeah yeah i would either switch them to normal arc and if they have the budget then a uh, blue filter but definitely not recommend a second pair of a blue cut lens okay so you would strongly let the patient know that blue cut is not the way you should be using it uh, we would recommend a blue filter or an arc okay Okay, what lens specification should be chosen for high anisometropic prescriptions, and uh, will change in index of lens cause any changes in the cosmetic appearance? So, any yes, and if you have like say minus ten in one eye, minus uh, say six point five or seven in the other eye, uh, the double aspheric lenses to some extent, ninety percent of the extent will will not show any difference. But if you are going to wear ordinary uh, spherical high index lens, then yes, the difference is going to be seen because the expire, the normal high index lenses do cause that minification effect. So yeah. cosmetically, it won't be so great. Okay. And would you ideally prescribe different index lens to overcome this anisometropic uh, problems for different eye? Do you do? Is that the question three? Is it? Sorry. Sorry. The question, Sakrudin. The third question. Yeah. Or? Yeah. Uh, yeah. This is another question. Just, just to add on this anisometropic. So, would okay. you actually recommend, uh, you know, different indexes for different eye, uh, taking into account the difference in the prescription? Do, do uh, no, I would it? say because you know the base curve of the lens changes if you are going to give a different index lens to both of them. So, I will say no. Even the company uh, representative says uh, recommend the same thing. It's not like if you have a minus nine the other eye, so you give a double aspheric over here and a single aspheric over here. That won't work. That might lead to is asthenopia because both lenses will be made of a different base curve. So no, keep the same index, same coverage over both lenses. Okay, okay. And uh, what if the patient wants natural vision? They don't want that yellowish effect, and but does not want complete blocking of the blue light. obviously turquoise is necessary so what would you recommend to this kind of patient i guess this is what uh, the attendee is asking they want natural vision but they want to get rid of blue light then go for a arc code because uh, actually working blue filter lens is going to have that yellowish tinge you cannot get away with that okay so you cannot have a blue filter lens which does not have a yellowish tinge oya is making that claim i'm not very sure because i'm not spoken to the the optometrist who is in charge of the all india optometrist uh, sorry the indian doctor who is in charge of the indian optometrist i'm not spoken to him they are making that claim currently hoya is claiming to have a blue filter lens which does not change the color but i need to you know uh, read few research articles before i support that claim 
okay i think that's pretty much it uh, we have taken almost uh, all the relevant questions for today and uh, thank you very much pancham sir for doing this uh, and you know taking us through uh, all the lens and frame selection and actually making us aware what is available not only in india but also for the you know international market and uh, i was very happy to see that conversion rates in terms of prices where you took efforts to change into us dollars as well for the international audience today so that was also uh, very kind enough thank you for doing that sir my pleasure yeah thank you for your so, patient listening yeah thank you so much thank you so much sir and tomorrow we are having a session on uh, how would you go about you know photography of the anterior segment is clinical relevance and uh, methods and techniques which uh, the speaker would share with us so please tune in tomorrow it's at same time as of today 6:30 evening uh, indian time and 9 pm late evening malaysian time uh, i would also like to wish uh, a happy ganesh chaturthi is a indian festival for those who are celebrating i think today is the day uh, when you worship uh, lord ganesha so happy festive uh, season ahead uh, it will be a 10 days full of festival now uh, and uh, Yeah so I'll see you all again tomorrow thank you so much for attending stay home stay safe take care and bye bye thank you pancham sir okay thank you thank you dr din thank you all